Thank you. Thank you, Tina, and thank you uh, to all of you for joining. It looks like a good crowd. So I'm just going to share my slides. So uh, based on the int introduction, uh, Tina uh, shared a lot that, that I've been doing with uh, NUS and Oregon State University. Um, but uh, as some of you may gather from the last bit of the introduction uh, that I've worked at BCCDC and uh, University of British Columbia, I am Canadian and I'm always uh, very happy to um, be back in Canada and speak, but also do uh, webinars and connect with the Canadian uh, crowd, uh, be it food safety or public health or environmental health. So uh, today I'm really um, honored to be here and to talk to you a little bit about some of the work that I've done over the years. And especially uh, some of the, one of the themes or areas that my research has focused on uh, we are interested in antimicrobial resistance, um, but from the food uh, food industry or food safety lens, uh, not um, necessarily public health, but it does tie into public health. So we try to uh, work on the problems that the food industry has and then uh, prevent some of the contaminations and issues down the line that are affecting public health and consumers. So with that, uh, CDC uh, estimates that about one in five resistant infections are caused by microorganisms that come from food um, and animals or animals that we use for food. And then uh, the contamination or the exposure, uh, rather exposure that people get from, uh, typically people get sick with these resistant infections through contaminated food or contaminated environment. But when we talk about resistance, and especially when it comes to um, resistance in the context of food and food safety, um, there's a lot of terms that get thrown into uh, that whole area. So there's antimicrobials. Um, our antimicrobial resistance really stems from the work that we've done over the years on focused on antibiotics. And now we've uh, looked into other compounds, how they affect microorganisms and how they affect um, all these uh, development of different mechanisms that may impact antibiotics. So now we see uh, words like tolerance, we see resistance in the context of sanitizers, disinfectants, um, and it can be very confusing. Um, so today I'm going to try to break it down um, into really the scope of the problem when it comes to standardization of some of the terminology that we use and how it affects um, public health and also what implications it has for food industry. So some of the terminology, what do we mean by resistance? What do we, me we mean by tolerance and also uh, persistence? So we use that uh, term as well. Um, when we talk about food industry or microorganisms that uh, may be encountered in within the food chain. So what happens in the food uh, specifically, I'm going to talk about food processing environments and then touch on antimicrobial resistance, which I'm going to um, abbreviate as AMR, uh, sanitation uh, angle, as well as uh, some of the terminology that we've been using, uh, such as co-selection and cross resistance. But let's first clarify some terms. So when we say antimicrobials, really this is um, a collective term that we use for antibiotics, but also for sanitizers and disinfectants and, and uh, other types of uh, compounds that can have antimicrobial activity. Uh, when we see biocides, sometimes this term is used, it's uh, defined in Europe, uh, it's not as uh, specifically uh, defined um, in, in North America, but it is interchangeably used with sanitizers and disinfectants, but it doesn't necessarily have exactly the same meaning. Um, typically in or definition in Europe for biocides is uh, products intended to destroy, render harmless, prevent the action of, or otherwise exert a controlling effect on any harmful organism by chemical or biological means. So it's a very broad definition. In contrast, sanitizers, uh, specifically in North America and uh, in US um, are regulated by uh, Environmental Protection Agency or EPA, 
and they're defined as a substance or mixture of substances that uh, help reduce the bacteria population in the inanimate environment by significant numbers, but does not destroy or eliminate all bacteria. So um, there are some bacteria that can still be left. And um, according to US EPA, uh, the sanitizer needs to have a five log reduction or 99.999% uh, of bacteria on food contact surfaces. And then we're, when we're talking about non-food contact surfaces, then they require three logs or 99.9%. And then disinfectants, and I know that a lot of people have now um, been using the word disinfectants because we've heard a lot about disinfectants uh, during COVID um, and uh, in general, um, you know, maintaining hygiene uh, in the last few years. And so um, there's been sometimes interchangeable use between sanitizers and disinfectants, but disinfectants are defined again, according to EPA, as a substance or mixture of uh, substances that destroys or irre irreversibly inactivates bacteria, fungi, and viruses, but not necessarily bacterial spores in uh, the inanimate environment. Again, both of these are um, used on inanimate objects or inanimate environments. And the disinfectants, are uh, defined or required to have six log reduction for both food contact and non-food contact surfaces for bacteria and fun uh, fungi. And then for virus control, it's determined by product approval. And so these are some of the, so there are differences, uh, but when we, when we look at um, research and we look at publications, especially when they come from different parts of the world, sometimes these uh, terms are used interchangeably. So it's really important to be aware of that. So now when we move on to uh, talking about resistance, uh, resistance uh, really, when we talk about bacterial resistance, and that's something that I'm, as a food microbiologist, I focus on bacteria, um, their resistance is associated with numerous molecular mechanisms and really depends on the agent that we're talking about. Um, but resistance has been sort of the term has been coined during our investigations or understanding of antibiotics and the usage of antibiotics. So in most, um, in most studies, we quantify it by the minimum inhibitory concentration or what we call MICs. And minimum, that's the concentration of typically an antibiotic that is needed to prevent the growth or net growth of the bacterial culture. So we measure it by exposing bacteria to uh, different concentrations, typically increasing concentrations of the antimicrobial in a standardized growth medium. And this growth medium can be different depending on what we're, which bacteria we're working with. And in practice, it's typically um, a minimum concentration at which we don't see the growth, usually after 16 to 20 hours of exposure to that particular uh, antimicrobial. And so in simple terms, um, when we measure it, here's a, a figure um, looking at susceptible bacteria versus resistant bacteria. And so here on the, uh, in the green with the, uh, on the top, uh, green color, we see the uh, testing of a microorganism that would be considered susceptible, for example, with uh, MIC being in between two and four. So we would say uh, four micrograms per uh, milliliter would be the MIC value. And then we have in red underneath it, an example of a resistant microorganism that has much higher MIC, uh, which is uh, 128 um, micrograms per milliliter. So these are just arbitrary numbers um, as an example. Now, when it comes to tolerance, it becomes a lot more um, complex to uh, study and report and understand. Uh, it really is defined as the ability of bacteria population to survive a transient exposure to antimicrobials, um, even at those concentrations that are much greater than the MICs. So um, when we talk about tolerance, we really, um, it only applies to uh, bactericidal antimicrobials, so the ones that are intended to kill the bacteria. Um, not the ones that are bacteriostatic antimicrobials because these are intended to stop the growth but not to uh, fully kill the bacteria. So tricky bit about tolerance strains is that they can have the same MIC as non-tolerant strains. And so I'll, I'll show you an illustration what we mean by that. Um, but what it typically, what we see is that for tolerant strains, 
um, they require longer exposure to antimicrobial rather than higher concentration uh, to lead to the same level of microbial reduction or the killing of bacteria. And so one of the terms that has been um, suggested to for tolerance, but not widely used or um, in the literature, you'll see is this minimum duration for killing or MDK um, to better measure tolerance to antimicrobial exposure. So how does tolerance work? Um, typically we see two different mechanisms. We see tolerance by slow growth and in some of the microorganisms such as mycobacterium tuberculosis, this is an inherent trait. So um, bacteria uh, or some of the species or strains really have this inherent um, slow growth rate. And when we see that, that means the bacteria are not taking up um, the antibiotic or antimicrobial or any, any um, nutrient at the same rate that um, the other you know, faster growing bacteria are. And so by slowing its growth, it's also not, um, it becomes inherently more tolerant because it's not uptaking all these uh, uh, compounds. And then we also see the non-inherited. Um, and this happens when you really have poor conditions for growth. And so bacteria slow down their metabolism uh, to preserve their energy and uh, help them in, with the survival. So this is typically when they're exposed to some uh, ex external stress and they, they uh, slow the growth and so whatever is in there um, that you're trying to attack them with, they are not uptaking as fast either. And then we have tolerance by lag. And lag, so when we talk about bacteria, they have lag phase and they grow in the log logarithmic phase. So the lag phase is usually this time for bacteria to, um, to adjust to the conditions and then to be able to start the growth. So for example, under starvation conditions, they need some adjustment times to resume exponential growth when they are adjusted to favorable and favorable environment. So when they're starved and transferred to fresh growth medium, they go from lag to log phase. Um, and then we also see the transient phenotype that disappears when bacteria are adjusted to the new condition. So um, an example, if we have Listeria and we put it in the fridge, uh, some um, microorganisms might take Two, some may take um, 10, some may take 20 hours uh, of this lag phase before they can adjust to cold temperature and then they start growing. So this is what we mean by lag. Um, in the illustrate, to illustrate the susceptible versus tolerant bacterial strains, again, um, in the green here, we have the susceptible, toler a susceptible strain, which has the MIC around four. And then uh, underneath it, we have in blue, um, the uh, tolerance strain, which has the same MIC, um, but for example, for 99% of the bacterial cell population here uh, in this graph underneath, the fractions of survivors, uh, the green you'll see, um, it takes about a um, little less than three hours uh, for, for the bacteria to be killed. Um, but when you look at Tolerance. So, for example, for 99%, when you look at the susceptible versus tolerant, right, this time goes from two to a little uh, over or a little less than six hours. So, it takes them much longer um, at this same concentration of, uh, let's say, four micrograms per milliliter to be uh, to be killed. And uh, then there's persistence. So persistence um, is one of the terms um, that we, we worry about uh, in food industry. When we talk about bacteria that are able to um, embed themselves in the food processing environment and then intermittently shed um, and persistently cause this contamination. But we also use this term uh, when we talk about uh, subpopulation of bacteria that are not killed by antimicrobials. Um, and they sometimes we refer to them as persisters. And typically these persisters are less than 1% of the population. And again, they require um, a slower or they have the, they're killed at a much slower rate than those susceptible cells. Um, when we 
Where we see persistence or where we worry about the persisters is uh, typically in these at the community level and um, in the food industry, we um, worry about biofilm. So especially if bacteria get embedded in some of the equipment or um, niches in the environment that are hard to reach or uh, equipment that's hard to disassemble and clean and sanitize. And so cleaning and sanitizing efforts uh, don't uh, fully reach. Sometimes bacteria can uh, hide in there, accumulate um, with you know foods or organic materials and develop these communities or biofilms. And then they inherently become a lot more difficult to, to reach and the, um, the cleaning and the sanitizers can penetrate as well. So here's an illustration of um, what happens at the community level um, and the antibiotic, uh, for example, trying to get to the um, different levels of bacteria. So here we have the gradient uh, of nutrients, oxygen, and exogenous substances. So we have uh, more oxygen on the top, and these are more metabolically active um, surface cells uh, depicted here in orange. And then on the bottom, we have these green cells that are uh, less active, they're deep layer cells, and they're more um, anaerobic conditions, less oxygen in there. Um, and then in between, um, so just by having this layer, it's uh, harder for antibiotic to penetrate uh, within the cell or within this uh, level of community. But for some that antibiotics that do penetrate, right, they are not acting at full strength. And so what we see is that uh, this one percent of population um, can develop these persister cells or blue cells that can be at the top and they can also be on the bottom. Um, but in terms of um, understanding these uh, persisters from the antimicrobial um, resistance point, it becomes even harder, right? Because they again they have they may have the same MIC or I mean inhibitor concentrations as susceptible. Um, but then they require um, and a similar, then also a similar uh, MDK to a susceptible strain. So 99% of uh, population and that killing rate, um, but then a much smaller level, right? At 99.99% uh, of bacterial cells in that population is substantially higher uh, MDK for a persistent strain than for a susceptible strain. So studying these becomes uh, a little more tricky. So what does AMR, now that we kind of know some of these terms and uh, what we're dealing with, what does AMR, or antimicrobial resistance, look like in the food chain? So in the food chain, when we think about where bacteria come, a lot of them come from the natural environment. So um, I work with Listeria monocytogenes that lives in the soils and, and decaying vegetation. And so there's a lot of different exposures before the bacteria even come um, close to the food. So whether um, the exposure comes in the fields, in the agricultural environment, or whether that's in the food uh, production environment or processing environment. Um, but bacteria during this uh, cycle of life can be exposed to a lot of different um, compounds. Um, so we see, for example, heavy metals in the soils and um, effluents and environment antibiotics as well. And then uh, once we uh, move towards uh, pesticides as well, uh, potentially in the environment, in the production environment. And then as we move towards the food processing environment, there's the different preservatives that we may be using. Um, and then as well as sanitizers or disinfectants, depending on what's being used in these environments. Uh, so this typically triggers some form of activation of stress response. And typically in bacteria, these are very complex um, mechanisms or complex bacterial stress response. So this is not just one mechanism, but it's a, it's a myriad of our network, rather network of mechanisms that get triggered depending on the stress and the level of stress. Uh, when we uh, look at um, heavy metals and specifically sanitizers and disinfectants, a lot of times uh, bacteria or the stress will trigger the overexpression of something we would call efflux pumps. And these are literally the pumps that expel the compound that's uh, causing stress or toxicity to the cell. It's expelling it from the cell. So a lot of times these efflux pumps play a really important role. 
And what we see on the other end, depending on how um, successful the stress response is and how mild the stress really is, a bacteria can develop some level of tolerance um, they can also develop the, some level of resistance depending on what the compound is. And we have a scene, what we call co-selection co um, phenomena or cross-resistance. And so I have been studying, or my lab has been studying, um, specifically when we use sanitizers, what type of sanitizer induced cross-resistance to antibiotics do we see? And is this a, a real problem or a growing problem? Uh, to give you an idea, here's a schematic overview of the main sources of antimicrobials and routes of transmission of uh, AMR along the food chain uh, from a paper from 2019. Um, and here we have, you know, three broken down to three levels. We have the primary production with the farmers. We have agriculture farms, aquaculture, and animal husbandry. And we have different uh, antibi antimicrobials uh, that um, at each level, there might be exposures, um, antibiotics or usage, uh, pesticides, sanitizer, disinfectants. These are some of the compounds. Um, then we have the food industry. So we have the food handlers, people that are making the food. We have the surfaces, the food contact and non-food contact surfaces that uh, in the food within the food processing environment. And then we also have raw materials that are coming in that ha might have some uh, exposures to preservatives with antimicrobial activity. And then uh, at the end, we have the household. And so what happens in the consumers or how consumers handle the foods as well as um, and, uh, and products, what type of product we're talking about. Uh, in the interest of time, I'm going to focus a little bit on the food industry um, side of it and specifically a food processing environment. So what happens in the food processing environment? Um, similar to that natural cycle, right? We have the influence of food uh, processing depending on what type of hurdles or what type of formulations we have for the foods. Um, usually we use a combination, what we call of these hurdles, uh, where we want to um, minimize, let's say, um, the cooking or the harshness of the processing uh, so that we can preserve the flavors and the compounds within the food. So sometimes we play with the formulations, um, lowering uh, pH, lower, lowering water activity, uh, all of these hurdles to help us um, decrease the survival of microorganisms, unwanted microorganisms in the foods, and also using refrigeration to slow down if anything is uh, left. So there's a lot of different um, processing techniques that will impact bacteria as well that are, especially if uh, bacteria are mildly exposed to some of the stresses so they don't die. Um, we know that mild exposure to some of these stresses can lead to tolerance to that specific stress. Um, as I mentioned, biofilms are a big problem in the industry um, because we there's uh, not a whole lot that we can do when biofilms uh, uh, get formed, uh, especially in the areas when they're, we, we don't necessarily see them. Um, and they can be um, quite detrimental to, um, to the food industry in, in general, but they can be detrimental in terms of um, e economically, how much it costs to uh, clean and sanitize on a regular basis versus when you have a biofilm. So it's a, a different mindset that the industry needs to have when they discover uh, biofilms. Uh, and then um, at the end of the chain, um, we really worry about this cross resistance and co-selection to antibiotics and um, from the usage and how we use chemical antimicrobials such as sanitizers in these environments. So let's take a look at how antimicrobials become less uh, effective. Um, so here's an il illustration um, of the biocide action and some of the factors, and then uh, what type of resistance it can lead to. Um, so at the basic sort of level, we have impaired uptake. So if, uh, again, if the bacteria slow down their growth, uh, if they change their uh, membrane structures, um, then there may be impaired uptake. Um, then we have uh, modification or overproduction of the target site of antimicrobial. Uh, 
um, absence of enzymes or metabolic pathways, and then also efflux of antimicrobial. These are some of the common ways that bacteria can battle um, antimicrobials. And typically we see that some of these we see with antibiotics, especially antibiotics that have a very specific mode of action or target site, uh, bacteria can um, develop resistance over time because it's not uh, acting on overall cell. When it comes to biocide action or sanitizer and disinfectants, uh, they have, um, they're usually not very specific, but they are uh, they don't have a specific target, but they have several uh, ways that they impact or kill the bacteria. All right, so um, there's factors to think about, uh, what contact time we're talking about, what concentration we're talking about. Uh, some sanitizers also inf um, impacted by temperature, uh, pH, as well as organic loads. Uh, for example, um, a lot of industry, especially in the fresh produce industry, we use a lot of uh, bleach. Um, bleach is sensitive to organic loads. So if we have high organic loads, um, which we do in the fresh uh, produce industry, right, those all can impact uh, the level of effectiveness of the sanitizer. Um, in terms of resistance, right, aggregation, um, what we see with viruses uh, is one way to uh, clump together and fight this uh, penetration and effect of the um, sanitizer or disinfectant, uh, biofilms, as I mentioned, and then there's different uh, barriers. So for gram-negative bacteria, they have the outer membrane, uh, which is uh, difficult to penetrate. Uh, mycobacterial cell wall have different types of cell walls as well, um, in addition to their slow growth rate. Uh, then there's fungal cell wall, cysts, and spore coats. So there's different mechanisms as well and barriers uh, that we have to think about depending on what microorganism we're working with. And then there's biocide or um, um, antimicrobial inactivation and efflux pumps or efflux, as I mentioned. So what are some of these consequences of stress exposures that we specifically see and some of the terms that we use? So we see stress adaptation. So specifically in food industry, we worry about this sublethal concentrations that can lead to intrinsic resistance and uh, or progeny that has um, resistance or higher tolerance, uh, or what we call also decreased susceptibility to the whatever that inducing agent or antimicrobial is, or other unrelated antimicrobials as well. Then we see cross resistance as well. So this is resistance to antimicrobials with the same molecular targets, right? Um, depending on what those targets are, but sometimes you know the same the micro or antibiotic that has uh, same molecular targets. Um, if bacteria becomes resistant resistant to one, we see cross resistance to the other. Then we see a co selection as well. So this is resistance to several antimicrobials having unrelated targets or modes of action. And then often uh, sequential linking of separate genes conferring resistance to different antibiotics, uh, sometimes on plasmids or integrons, and then they can be transferred together. And then we also see cross protection, adaptation to one stress associated with increased resistance to another unrelated stress. Um, and again, um, these will differ within different microorganism or different species. From the sanitizers and disinfectants that we use in the food industry, these are some of the common ones, quaternary ammonium compounds or quats, uh, hypochlorites, as I mentioned, bleach, uh, peroxyacetic acid or PAA, chlorine dioxide and iodoforms. Iodophores are also used, but probably the most common are the first three, the quats, uh, bleach and, and PAA. When we look at all the scientific evidence or the research that has been done over the years, there's really no evidence that sanitizers are ineffective if they're used according to the label and manufacturer recommendations. Now, the question becomes, are they always used that way? And there are circumstances when they're not um, used that way. Um, there are, you know, again, when we have biofilms, the concentrations are not, uh, bacteria are not being exposed to the intended concentrations. Sometimes there's certain dilution effect that happens. So there's a lot 
If you think about the food industry, it's a very dynamic uh, environment. So there's a lot of things that can happen. And when we see outbreaks and contamination, large contamination events, it's usually not just one thing that fails. It's usually several um, cascading effects that lead to it. So what's being reported from the research standpoint? Uh, here are some of the studies that have experimentally worked with uh, different antimicrobials and then exposed bacteria to antibiotics to see uh, what level of um, resistance or reduced susceptibility bacteria can develop. So some work with triclosan and uh, um, Escherichia coli or E. coli uh, led to resistance to different antibiotics. So when they exposed cells of E. coli for 30 days to triclosan at concentrations of 0.2 milligrams per liter, um, they saw some resistance or reduced susceptibility to um, levofloxacin, amoxicillin, tetracycline, and chlorophenicol. Uh, similarly, when they worked with, with researchers worked with Pseudomonas aeruginosa and used benzyl clonium chloride, which is a type of quaternary ammonium compound, a quat, um, they did adaptive selective experiments uh, for the bacteria in the presence of uh, benzyl clonium chloride for more than 300 uh, generations. So very long exposure and generation um, or growing pseudomonas in the presence of uh, benzyl clonium chloride. And they saw resistance to polymyxin, tetracycline, and ciprofloxacin. Um, and then another uh, gram-negative microorganism, Salmonella tamphimerium, um, they did a mixture of aldehydes and quads, a quad, an oxidative compound, and halogenated uh, tertiary amine compound. They uh, cultured bacteria repeatedly over four days, so uh, four, eight uh, subcultures uh, in each uh, biocide in each compound, and they saw resistance to naldexate acid, ciprofloxacin, chloramphenicol, and tetracycline. Uh, when it comes to gram positive, so Listeria monocytogenes is a microorganism that I work a lot with. Um, the researchers um, uh, experimentally exposed uh, repeatedly uh, bacteria to uh, two milligrams per milliliter of ciprofloxacin or 10 uh, micrograms per milliliter of uh, benzyl clonium chloride. And they saw that ciprofloxacin adapted or benzyl clonium adapted strains. Um, had reduced susceptibility to gentamicin and benzoclonium chloride, ciprofloxacin, ethidium bromide, and TPP as well. Now, one concern here is the gentamicin part um, because gentamicin is actually used in the treatment of listeri listeriosis for uh, very um, invasive cases of listeriosis. And then um, the work we did also we did the opposite. We cultured um, bacteria repeatedly to high ciprofloxacin concentrations to see uh, does it have the reverse effect as well. And we saw that um, ciprofloxacin adapted strains would reduce susceptibility to benzoclonium chloride and uh, gentamicin, but only in some of the strains. So this uh, effect was not seen across all the strains that we tested, only a handful of them um, led to this uh, change. So it's not um, a wide, wide reaching conclusion that all Listeria monocytogenes will adapt to uh, or uh, have reduced susceptibility, susceptibility to gentamicin. But there are different mechanisms in different strains that get triggered uh, that could uh, lead to reduced susceptibility. So what do we know about resistance, tolerance, susceptibility to these, especially when we look at quats? Uh, that we use in the food industry. So resistance is, and I'm putting it in quotes because uh, it really isn't resistance. So it's typically very low level. Um, more appropriate terminology would be reduced susceptibility or increased tolerance rather than resistance. So this is something that has been, uh, we've tried to stress over the years to really limit the word resistance for truly resistant strains or limit to um, when we talk about antibiotics, because it's very clear cut when something is resistant for antibiotic versus something that is uh, for, for um, biocides or for the sanitizers. So it really, what we see is that it does not lead to resistance at concentrations that are recommended for use in the food industry. So what, when we see these differences between different strains, it's at much lower concentrations though, than what would be 
uh, used in the industry. Some of the mechanisms that we see for this uh, rather tolerance is again, reductions in cell permeability. Um, and then we see in Listeria monocytogenes specifically, we see efflux pumps. So there have been several efflux pumps identified in Listeria that lead to um, reduced um, susceptibility to quads. So we did um, in my lab, one of my students, Rebecca Bland, um, investigated cross-resistance development between commercial sanitizers and antibiotics in Listeria that we uh, collected from food processing environments. So what we did uh, to determine the potential for cross-resistance, we used the wild type, we used six strains. So wild type strains here depicted in these little lovely bacteria in black. And then we also, uh, these same strains, we adapted them to three parts per million of quaternary ammonium compound and, uh, or commercial quaternary ammonium compound. And these, uh, to put this into perspective, um, 200 parts per million is typically used, is the lowest used on the food contact, contact, uh, food contact surfaces. And then on non-food contact surfaces, such as in drains and other parts of the environment in the food processing, um, we can use anywhere from 600 to 800, depending on the formulation and type of quad. But we use much, much greater concentrations, right, in the industry compared to what we did. So we did three parts per million. And the reason why we did three parts per million, we couldn't actually adapt them higher. So we did subculturing. Oh, sorry. We did subculturing. Uh, over time, but um, the highest we could get uh, without them dying was three parts per million. So then we determined minimum inhibitory concentration change from the wild type to the quad, okay? And then we assessed antimicrobial resistance uh, using disk diffusion assays to 17 different antibiotics. At the same time, we did um, parent sequencing, whole genome sequencing of the wild type and the adapted isolates and compared them side by side. Um, and this is what we saw. So here is um, here is a figure showing antibiotic susceptibility of wild type and adapted strain. So on the x-axis, we have the isolate pairs. So uh, for example, um, this is WT is the wild type and QAD is quaternary ammonium adopted uh, type of this one particular strain. And we have six strains on the um, on this axis. And then on the Y, we have the antibiotic, and we had 17 antibiotics. And so what you um, see here, the green represents uh, these numbers that we have uh, within here are actually uh, the zone diameters that are measured in millimeters for each antibiotic. And so green represents the green color susceptible, so it's fully susceptible to the antibiotic. Intermediate means is higher than what we expect for susceptible, and red means it's resistant to this specific antibiotic. And uh, some of them, so the red was cefoxidin, for example, all of them were red. We expected that because Listeria has innate resistance to uh, cefoxidin. But then for these others, uh, what was interesting, uh, specifically for penicillin G and specifically for ciprofloxacin, is that uh, all the strains that started yellow, so it started with uh, intermediate, uh, resistance, they moved to red after um, after the adaptation to uh, quads. So there was definitely impact on uh, ciprofloxacin resistance. And then we also saw the same for penicillin G. Uh, we saw um, some other changes to varying degrees uh, from susceptible to intermediate for other micro uh, other antibiotics, but uh, nothing that you know specifically uh, stood out. The important thing here, though, is that we did not see any changes. Um, bacteria still remain susceptible to ampicillin, gentamicin, and cotrimoxazole, which are three common antibiotics used for treatment of listeriosis. Okay, so uh, genome, then we did the genome-wide analysis, and we saw uh, mutations in this one particular FEPR uh, regulator of a multidrug efflux pump, FEPA, across all adapted isolates tested. So there was definitely um, the, there was a link between regulate, this regulator for the multidrug efflux pump and the adaptation that we saw and then subsequent um, changes to the antibiotic uh, susceptibility. So what this, uh, these data highlighted for us is there is a potential for cross-resistant development between 
uh, quaternary ammonium compounds and antibiotics of different classes. Um, and specifically this mutation, the FBAR regulator um, is contributing to cross resistant to ciprofloxacin and listeria monocytogenes. So for that, so ciprofloxacin is not used in treatment of listeriosis, but it is uh, a commonly used antibiotic for urinary tract infections and um, other, other types of uh, infections. Mostly though by uh, gram negative bacteria, not so much for gram positive. So how relevant is all of this to public health? Um, in 2018, there was a, a great talk by uh, Dr. Ruth Petran. It was a, she's a prominent um, researcher and food safety uh, specialist uh, within um, International Association of Food Production. And uh, they did a review of the literature that um, highlighted several issues. Um, the, it revealed the lack of connection between resistance to antibiotics and biocides since real world conditions are not consistently mimicked and there is a misunderstanding of terms. The most common method used for the type of research is the MIC method, right? Which has been adopted from the testing for antibiotics and it works great for antibiotics, but it has been um, really misinterpretation of actual use conditions in the actual uh, food industry setting. And non-substantiated conclusions have been drawn by researchers against standard sanitation protocols that don't include effective cleaning followed by use of sanitizers under required conditions and concentrations. So uh, in other words, often what we see, researchers will do exposures of uh, bacteria to um, sanitizers, uh, but they will not be using uh, proper cleaning before exposing to sanitizers uh, and mimicking actual recommended uses for sanitizers. So this was also evident in our study we were not able to adapt isolates to high levels of commercial quaternary ammonium compounds. So um, that's that's good. And then while the potential for cross resistance between quaternary ammonium compound based sanitizer and selecting antibiotics exists, um, we did not see cross resistance between uh, antibiotics usually used to treat listeriosis and, um, and quaternary ammonium uh, compounds. So providing us with confidence that um, these the continued use of these antibiotics is appropriate for treating uh, listeriosis um, in invasive cases. Then we also did uh, uh, further research with a specific lens of listeria monocytogenes uh, in looking at resistance and tolerance and really found that research available to date fails to demonstrate resistance of listeria monocytogenes to recommended sanitizer treatments as prescribed by the label. So for quats and for other micro uh, other um, compounds as well. So we really caution, we wanted to caution that sanitizer tolerance would be a more accurate description when we talk about Listeria monocytogenes uh, response to low sanitizer concentration. So those sub manufacturer recommended concentrations and that we should really conserve the use of resistance to help us reduce this confusion um, and allow appropriate and concise messaging as sanitizer research findings are communicated to both industry and regulators. So to summarize, really the misuse of terms and non-realistic sanitizer application conditions in research uh, are potentially leading to reports of exaggerated resistant phenotypes when it comes to sanitizers. Um, there's no evidence that foodborne pathogens are becoming resistant to con sanitation conditions recommended by sanitizer manufacturers. But there are selective pressures that can occur and do occur in food processing. So sublethal sanitizer exposures, biofilms that we really do have to pay attention to because they can lead to subpopulation of environmental pathogens with these tolerant phenotypes to sanitizers. And as we saw to other uh, antimicrobials, including some classes of antibiotics. Um, and then potentially these could be contributing factors to survival of these microorganisms with these, uh, with these uh, uh, AMR markers. Um, we've seen co-selection and co-selection has been reported for foodborne pathogens, but there's still a lot of unknowns about mechanisms of resistance and tolerance and what triggers those events and effects on public health. Um, there's potential to cross resistance, specifically development between quads and antibiotics of different classes, but really need more research to understand the mechanisms behind this. Um, and then bottom line from the uh, food safety point of view and from the food industry point of view is that proper hygiene and food processing measures 
are really there to lower the risk of human exposure to antibiotic resistant bacteria, um, whether they originate from animal external environments, environments uh, through food uh, products. So we really still have to focus heavily on maintaining the hygiene and cleaning and sanitizing practices in these environments uh, to help us reduce any exposure to antibiotic resistant bacteria. And with that, um, I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you.